There isn't really a good pre-made resource for what I want to cover in this unit for eLearning 3.0, so I'm going to provide this video. Uh, this video is titled uh, From Repository to the Distributed Web. And what it's going to do is track how we've handled resources over time uh, from, say, the 90s when we had the client-server model to the present day. Now, I don't really have a section on repository. I'm going to take it that people have a sense of what a repository is. It's a centralized store, like a website, that has a whole bunch of resources in it. In the world of open educational resources, what we are doing right now is building repositories, these centralized stores of resources uh, that people can access. In this kind of model, licensing is very important, Distribu distribution is very important, sustainability is very important. I'm not going to get into those issues. I want to cover where we're going in the future. Uh, and I'm going to take us through this route from repository to the distributed web. So let's begin this by looking at something called the Content Delivery Network. Content Delivery Network isn't new. Uh, they've been around for 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and the idea of a content delivery network, as you can see, the traditional model has the server right in the center there, but a content delivery network distributes the content across a number of servers, and then each server provides access to people who are looking for that resource locally. So, for example, a content delivery network might have a server in Toronto, another one in New York, another one in London, another one in New Delhi, another one in Beijing. And when somebody clicks on a website, say Amazon.com, they don't get it straight from Amazon.com. They get it from the uh, content delivery network server that's in their local city, London, Beijing, etc. Uh, one common content delivery network is Cloudflare. They've been around, I think, since 2009. Um, and you've probably seen Cloudflare stuff. If you watch as your website loads, you'll see uh, calls to Cloudflare or calls to CDN for the individual resources. And again, what it does is it serves static content typically from uh, the data center to lower bandwidth consumption. Another one is Akamai, um, and Akamai uh, is probably the largest of the bunch. Certainly, they're the most well-established. Uh, they point out on their website that content delivery networks carry nearly half the world's internet traffic, which is an interesting thing considering how silently they operate in the background. Akamai itself carry somewhere between uh, 25 and 30 percent or so of the world's uh, internet traffic. So they are a huge player in the internet space. Um, in the video on their website they say, we like to think of ourselves at the center of everything and the websites as being at the edge. And you know, it's a, that's a, it's an accurate perspective. In addition to the uh, content delivery networks, we can have what are called peer-to-peer -peer content delivery networks. The idea here is the same. We're trying to save uh, you know, the amount of traffic on the internet by providing a more local server from which we can access the content. But instead of using a server like uh, the CDNs do, we use each other's computers. So here we are, we're all in a row, or we're all in a network together. This is you, this is me, this is my friend, this is your friend, etc. And what we've done is by using peer-to-peer -peer CDN software, we're offering up a portion of our resources, maybe some processing power, disk space, or network bandwidth, in order to make resources available to each other. Often there'll be resources we've consumed ourselves. So I might view a website and save that website on my uh, computer, and then when somebody else is looking for that same website, 
my computer might be the nearest place where they can find it. So an example of this, and you, you might not be thinking of it this way, but an example of this is BitTorrent. Now BitTorrent is, sometimes gets a bad rap because it's known for uh, streaming very large files like movie files or audio files, but really it can be used for any large content at all and it operates in this way. The uh, BitTorrent itself is a protocol, uh, it's the .torrent extension that you might see at the end of a URL and uh, what you need to do is tell your browser that if it sees a .torrent URL, it should launch your BitTorrent client. uTorrent is a BitTorrent client. It's uh, something that you install on your own computer and uh, it operates according to the BitTorrent uh, protocol, downloads your resource for you, and while you're doing that, makes uh, similar content available to other computers on the BitTorrent network. So you can sort of see what's happening here, right? Uh, instead of depending on the server at the center, we've pretty much entirely gotten away from that on the web as it is. Uh, and we're, for the most part, using either a content uh, distribution network or a peer-to-peer -peer kind of service, mostly CDNs. Which brings us to the distributed web project. Now, the idea here, it was introduced by Mozilla. Uh, it's been around actually a bit longer than the URL would suggest, which is you know, July of this year. The, the idea has been around a lot longer. Um, and the distributed web project itself has been around a lot longer. Um, but the idea here is, as I say, we're moving away from centralized, away from decentralized and toward a distributed model for the web. And instead of having to use, you know, special BitTorrent clients or whatever, um, we're looking at building this into the basic structure of the web itself. Um, that way we can use one kind of application for all the different kinds of distributed content that might be out there. And we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. Probably the best current way to access D-Web content is through something called the Beaker Browser. Uh, it's a browser, it, it functions just like uh, uh, Firefox or Chrome or Internet Explorer, except that it can also access D-Web content. So the Beaker Browser allows me to create a website using something called the DAT protocol and when I create a website using the DAT protocol here's the address for my website uh, I create it and then I publish this website and now my website has become part of this distributed web network. The idea of the Beaker browser is it doesn't just allow you to subscribe to or, or access dweb contents it also allows you to contribute to the dweb directly so here's my website here's me editing my website inside my beaker browser then when i publish it it publishes it with that big long string which is the address of that website that address is based on the content of my website uh, if I if I change the content the, the address changes and the idea here is that when people are out there looking for my website and they want to find it from the nearest peer in our peer-to-peer -peer network they don't find it by means of you know uh, an HTTP address they find it by means of this long string this hash based address so hash base is kind of like uh, a powerful peer-to-peer -peer node. Uh, it's basically a node that never shuts down. So it makes sure that your hash-based content will always be available on the peer-to-peer -peer web. Even if you shut off your computer, even if nobody else is hosting it, 
Hashbase will probably be hosting it. It's kind of interesting because Hashbase is almost like a content distribution network for the peer-to-peer -peer web. And they're, they're kind of living in that sort of middle space there. One of the really interesting developments in DWeb uh, comes from the Internet Archive. The Internet Archive, you might recall, is the uh, project by Brewster Cully to archive all of the Internet. And, and they've been working on this since 1997. Uh, they have petabytes, petabytes of data. And what they are, one of the big dangers with the Internet ar Archive is that it might go away. Uh, certainly, if you had a single centralized version of the Internet Archive, that would be a real concern. So they're building a D-Web version of the Internet Archive, putting all of their content into the distributed web. So you can access any of these contents here. In fact, I listened to an episode of Johnny Dollar this afternoon through this service, and you're accessing it through the D-Web, which means kind of you're, you're bit torrenting it, except it's not bit torrent, it's the modern day version of it. And I just listened to it through, well, what I did is uh, I accessed it using Beaker Browser and then I listened to, to it um, on Windows Media Player. That's the thing that popped up. I probably should have listened to it on uh, something a little more open source, but oh well. Related to this project is something called the Interplanetary File System. The Interplanetary File System is intended to be the underlying layer for all of these content-based or content-addressable hash-based resources. So here's what happens with Internet Planetary File System. As I mentioned, when we create a web resource, we need to give it an address and the address is based on its content. You take the content, you run it through an algorithm, SHA-2 say, and that produces what's called a hash. And this hash is like a fingerprint for this content. It's a content-based address. We use this fingerprint in order to access these resources. So the Internet Planetary File System is the system that organizes or allows us to organize different content-based addresses created by different systems, including the D-Web that I've just shown you, but not only the D-Web, others as well. In another video, I've, I've got uh, instructions on how to install IPFS, Interplanetary File System, on your own computer. And of course, there's some links here that you can see. The Again, you need to keep in mind that IPFS isn't the sort of service where uh, you use your browser and access it through a server out there somewhere. Um, in fact, what's happening is you run an IPFS application on your own computer, and then if you access content, you access it from that IPFS uh, server on your own computer. So IPFS, the, the application here, uh, is both providing you access to the files as well as providing uh, access to the files to other people. An example of this is something called IPFS Companion. This is a browser plugin and uh, down at the bottom there you'll see links for both the Firefox version and the Chrome version. The uh, plugin works with uh, your browser but instead of going out to a web browser, what it does is it looks for the running version of IPS on your own computer. And if, you're, if, you're, if your IPFS uh, program isn't running, this application will complain and say, you know, I can't do anything, I don't have access to your server. So, but what it does is it connects to that, uh, I probably shouldn't call it a server, I, application. The, the proper name is daemon. Um, so it accesses the daemon via uh, an API. So it sends a request to the daemon. The daemon sends it a response, usually in the form of files, etc. Behind the scenes, IPFS is managing 
its connections with other peers in the IPFS network and providing a host for uh, all kinds of files and not just the files that you're looking at. Uh, I ran it yesterday and it, it ended up connected to several hundred other peers on the IPFS network and it, it was running pretty snappy I, I, had to, I have to say. So related to IPFS is a concept of interplanetary linked data, IPLD. And this is the initiative that links the D-Web and IPFS itself with all of the other distributed content-based uh, content networks. So we have a stack, and I've talked about stacks before uh, in our e-learning 3.0 course. There's some underlying stuff here, the live P2P. Uh, that's the uh, system that your IPFS is using to communicate with other IPFS nodes in the network. But we have to define the data, which means two things. First of all, we need IPLD, which is the linked data format itself, and then IPNS, interplanetary name server. And what that will do is it will associate a node with the actual content. So for example, uh, IPFS, uh, if I have an IPFS node, I identify myself to the rest of the IPFS network by means of my public key, or more accurately, a hash of my public key. And then IPNS associates that with a resource on IPFS, which would be basically my IPFS homepage. And I have a website, which I created earlier with Beaker Browser, which is my IPFS home site. And then ultimately, and we're not really gonna cover this very much in this video, the applications at the top of the stack that use all of that data. What makes IPFS work is its data structure. And uh, I talked quite a bit about graphs earlier in this course, and, and people really wonder, well, what's the point? But the point is the graph is something that underlies all of this. And here is one such graph. This graph is called uh, a Merkle graph. It kind of looks like a tree, but as you can see with the cross links and things like that, it isn't exactly a tree. Uh, to be precise, it's called a directed, sorry, directed acyclical graph or DAG. And so it's called a Merkle DAG, which is kind of a mouthful. You thought MOOC was bad. Well, I didn't come up with Merkle DAG. Someone else did. Um, so the idea here is, here is, say, uh, a resource. Now, these are other links that might be parts of that resource or maybe related to that resource in some way. So this might be a web page, this might be the style sheet, an image, another image, a font. And then some of these might be related to other things as well. These things can get fairly complex. There's no single way they have to be associated. These can be any kind of contents whatsoever. So they can be web pages, they can be images, they can be movies or videos, they can be transactions in a, a financial transaction network, they can be applications or programs, they can be contracts, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? The only thing that needs to be the case is that they have to have this address, and this address is a hash based on the contents of that resource. And what's neat is this address is a hash based on the contents of this resource, which includes all of this. Change this, you have to change this, and then you have to change this. So, the interplanetary linked data is what some people call the permanent web because when you, cre when you change data on IPFS or in interplanetary linked data, 
you're not changing something that's on the web. What you're doing really is you're creating a new updated version of it. So it's like you're, you're recreating the page anew. The old page or the old thing, whatever it was, is still out there, still part of this, uh, this uh, hash graph, this Merkle uh, graph, and still part of the interplanetary file system. So that way, uh, as things get changed on the web, we still have the old version of the web that we could use if we wanted to, just by using those, uh, those old hash addresses. And you can see why Internet Archive is so interested in this. Internet Archive takes a snapshot of a web, uh, a website every day, or sometimes it changes a lot, multiple times a day. And it can't just overwrite the same file uh, it needs to have a tree like this and be updating that tree by creating new versions and almost layering it on top. So interplanetary linked data is important because not only does it link the interplanetary file system, DWeb content, it also links things like GitHub, like Ethereum, and like Bitcoin. The idea here is that it sort of stands at the center of what we call an hourglass model, where at the top we have the applications, uh, you know, websites, media chain, etc., and then the naming protocols for that, like the domain name service or block stack for blockchain or interplanetary naming uh, service. Then this, then underneath the exchange protocol. BitTorrent, which we talked about, or BitSwap, or other kinds of protocols. And then underneath that, the different kinds of routing and network protocols that actually manage the distribution of content from peer to peer in the overall network. Interplanetary linked data consists of six major components. I'm only going to talk about one really, which will be the, the top one, the, uh, the content ID. But the rest of these are all equally important parts of interplanetary linked data. The data model for uh, universal resolution serialization format so that we can represent linked data in, in formats like JSON or HTML or even plain text, tools and libraries, selector for selecting parts of a big graph and then transformations to change a graph from one kind of graph, you know, to a different graph. So you begin with a graph, you run a transformation on it, you've changed the graph. So as I said, these distributed, authenticated, hash-linked data structures, uh, they've been around for a long time. This one up here in the upper left is called Plan 9 from Bell Labs. It actually dates from the 1990s. Uh, BitTorrent is a very simple one. Uh, I saw it in a video today referred to as uh, uh, not a tree, but a shrub. Git and GitHub and that whole software development uh, network that people use so much is all based on Merkle trees and hash uh, graph addressed addresses, but also Bitcoin and Ethereum and blockchain in general, again, are using the same kinds of underlying data structures. So the idea of the content identifier is to create a universal protocol that allows content in any of these networks to refer to content in any other of these networks. So for example, uh, I could in my uh, DWeb content uh, have a link into an Ethereum contract and if you're browsing my content you just click on that link and that takes you right into the Ethereum network contract. Similarly, uh, you know, a transaction in Ethereum might refer to something in GitHub or might refer to some content on the internet, interplanetary file system. So there are different aspects here uh, of the content identifier to indicate the, uh, the, the network that's being used, 
the type of encryption or encoding that's being used and also to specify the length of the resource. So here's, here it is in action. So we have the version MCP, MPH, these are, this is the MH is the hash itself. And then you have tables that define what each of these three things are. And as I said, they're the, uh, the transport scheme and the, uh, the hashing or encryption scheme. Here we have an example of a content identifier. Uh, so we have one object and it's basically composed of two objects. If we look, if we resolve one part of it, you see we get the data, hello. If we resolve another part of it, we get the data world. And if we resolve the third one, we get hello world all together. That's my presentation. Uh, I hope you found it interesting, useful. I know I got a bit technical near the end. Don't worry about that. A lot of this is gonna happen behind the scenes. But the really important thing to remember here is we are gradually, to be sure, but very definitely year after year, moving toward a more distributed web. And we're moving toward this more distributed web because as time goes by, at both the network level, the backbone level, as well as at the content level, uh, we're discovering the weaknesses of the centralized model and indeed even the federated or content distribution network kind of model. So think about this when you think about learning resources. If we're starting today with learning resources in centralized repositories, this series of developments should paint a pretty clear map as to where these learning resources are going to go over the next 5, 10, 20 years. That's it for me. I'm Stephen Downs. Hope you found this useful and uh, I'll talk to you again.